Hey everybody, Adam here with Hometown Acres. We are joined by a guest today. This is Randy, and Randy is interested in purchasing an Easy Boardwalk 40 sawmill and wanted to stop over and take a look at it. And I thought this was a pretty good opportunity to really kind of go over this sawmill in detail now that we've had it for about three years. I've gotten to know this sawmill pretty well. I think I know just about everything there is to know about it. Um, and for the last two or three years, we really haven't talked about the mill much in the videos. We pretty much just use it, which is kind of the way I like to do things is I, I don't really want to be a, a, a salesman on the equipment in the videos that I'm showing you guys. I just want to use it. And if you like it, you find more information on it and then buy it. But in today's case, I kind of am going to be a salesman for easy boardwalk, walking Randy through this thing. Now, Randy, what do you already know about this mill? And then we can kind of help fill in the gaps. Uh, just through some of my research, looking at this mill and other mills, one of the first things that stood out to me was how solidly built it is uh, with the six inch C channel, uh, one piece, and the angle cut. So, you know, I, I've looked at quite a few videos of other easy boardwalk mills besides the one that Adam owns, and that nobody's ever said anything bad about them yeah. at all for a. You know, for a completely manual mill, it just seems like you can't go wrong. And I've compared it with some other ones and just wanted to look at this one, see one in person. Uh, he was nice enough to let me come down here and look at it. So, yeah, so let's, uh, I'll pull the camera off the tripod here and we'll start walking around this mill. Sure. So, yeah, I think the, the three biggest selling features of this sawmill, well, I guess four, the biggest one is it's American made, right? They're made yeah. in, uh, I believe, Missouri. 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 Um, but other than that is just the simplicity in the design of this mill. Uh, like you said, it's got a C-channel framework. It's all one solid piece. Uh, a lot of other sawmills, each track is a separate piece that you've got to link together and level all of the feet to get a nice flat platform so that the mill will cut your boards flat. This one, you really don't have to worry about that. I mean, you still want to level up the feet, but it's not going to, you're not going to see much deviation. Right, this, you're not leveling multiple sections and trying to get them to mate up. And Yeah, this sawmill cuts, if you've got a good sharp brand new blade on there, it cuts pretty true and flat. That's what I've got the saw, or that uh, six foot level there for, is when I right. make a cut, I'll put that straight edge on the cuts and make sure that it's still cutting level because I know if it's not, it's not the mill, it's the blade. It's and the I know blade, it's, yeah. it's time to change out the blade. Yep. So another thing that is kind of distinctive that this is the only mill on the market that has it is this angled saw head blade. As you look at it, it's not straight on like every other mill on the market, it is angled. The thought behind that is much like when you're, you know, dogging your chainsaw bar into a tree and you're able to kind of lean into it and cut, it helps pull the saw through the wood. The idea is the same on this. I, I've never run a straight head sawmill, so I, I can't compare it to say right. if it you know actually works that way and helps pull the, the blade through the log. Uh, but like I said, this mill cuts straight, true, and fast. So I'm probably gonna, uh, until I get a structure made for it, if I buy it, I'm gonna put it in my barn. Yeah. And I just pull it straight out onto to where I'm gonna saw at, and yep. then when the weather gets bad, push it back in. Yeah, that is the nice thing with the trailer package. The axle with the wheels just bolts right onto the frame, and then you've got your tongue right here that you pull it by. Right. Um, so pretty quickly you can have this thing mobile. And so the trailer package is an additional add-on. Another thing that I would not own this mill without is this jack on this end here. So when you're trying to center the pith on a, on a log, like you can see right now, it's right. it's fat on this end, skinny on this end. This end needs to come up. Um, and when you're milling, you really want to get that, the center of the log centered with where your cut is going to be. So this allows you to raise and lower and jack up the log to get a nice flat cut on the first side. And then after that, you drop it all the way down and, and you're all squared up and ready to go. Correct. But to really be an efficient Sawyer, you've got to have something to level the log on the mill. Yeah, I've seen you in your previous videos uh, demonstrating that, and that's that's definitely an option that I'm going to go with. I thought might, maybe I could just put a, you know, a floor jack under there and mess around with that, but it's it's, it's just, so nice. There's to a have price it. to it, but it's a uh, it's minimal compared to the price in the mill. The, mo the money you're putting out for this mill, anyway, just have have a uh, have them add that on. And having it incorporated into the mill, it's yeah. just, I mean. 
Yeah, it's a buy once, cry once kind of thing, but for the next however many years you own the mill, you're going to be happy you have it. It's going to make uh, sawing a much more enjoyable experience. Yeah, definitely. So the standard version of this will mill a 16-foot log, um, and they sell additional track extensions, I think in either four or six-foot increments. But I'll tell you, for what we've done here, and we've sawn a ton of lumber, I have never milled anything or even wanted to mill anything bigger than 16 foot. Right. Um, That's probably where I'm at too. The biggest thing that we mill is probably 12, maybe 14 here and there. I mean, to get a, a 14 foot section of a tree or a 16 foot section of a tree that's straight and true right. is pretty tough. And the second you get a curve, any kind of curve, even right. a two inch little <laughs> dog leg in a log, it just cuts the amount of lumber that you can get out of that log by like a third. It's crazy how just a little curve pretty much ruins the whole thing. First thing, did, did you put a stop in here? Is that what this is on the side? No, or, they put that they on put there. That on? So okay. if, if, so the, there, there is a break on the mill, right. um, on the power head. And so to release that, you know, now it'll go. And there's go. just a stop here in the back. Yep, there's a stop in the back. But when you release the brake, if you had a really strong gust of wind that came, right. you can still, it takes a good bit to push it, but that stop down there is to keep the whole power head from either blowing off one side or blowing off this side. So, um, I mean, if we have a big storm coming, what I'll usually do is I'll grab a ratchet strap and throw it around the top and throw it yeah. around the frame just right. to really suck it down tight, especially because I added this roof to it. Right. You know, now it's like a big kite. We've had some serious windstorms. I mean, we've had some windstorms that have taken the power out for three, four days and uh, have not, knock on wood, had any issues with this thing. Good. So for traveling down the road, too, if you're going to go mill somewhere else or for me to, to go pick it up, I'm probably going to strap it down, too, when I do that. Yeah. Strap it to the frame. Another thing that people will do is they'll take a, a vice clamp and, grips. yeah, vice grips and put it right there just so it's locked between that stop and this stop. Yeah. And then it can't go anywhere between that and the brake and if you put a ratchet strap on it. Right. So we can go ahead and pop open the cover here. <clears throat> and actually, yeah, if you look here, um, it's, like for friction. It's, it's, it's like a belt, yeah, yeah, on top of the wheel. And so that's a, a wear item that eventually will wear out and could be replaced. But it's nice that you're never gonna need to replace the actual wheel itself. You've got a wear item covering that. Yeah. This machine is extremely easy to grease. You've got some bearings here around, you know, your idlers, and uh, bearings here in the flywheels. This uh, is for wiping off the dust. Yeah. Yep. It just catches any big chunks and keeps it from going in through here. Yeah. I probably don't do as good of a job of cleaning this mill as I should, and you can see even without. I mean, occasionally I'll bring a leaf blower down here and, and blow it off, but for not really doing much, it still looks pretty good. Yeah. What are you planning on running for blade lube? Um, I'm probably going to do what you're doing, which is the um, washer fluid and a yep. little uh, water and dishwashing fluid. Or dish, so dish soap. In, the, in the summertime, I do water and dish soap, and in yeah. the wintertime, I, I do the windshield washer fluid. Um, I used to do diesel. The thing with diesel is, is when you're pulling the logs or the slabs or everything off the mill, your right. gloves are getting covered in diesel. You go into the house smelling like an oil refinery. Um, it does do a good job if you're milling pine and you're getting a lot of pitch build up on the blade. Like you can see, I got a little bit here. Yeah. Um, if that starts to build up real bad, it can cause the blade to not cut straight. Yeah. Right. So the diesel kind of cuts that. What size do you think you're going to be milling? Like logs? I mean, do you probably, think you're going to be max? I'm probably going to keep, you know, I, most for the most part, I'm probably maxing at 20. Okay. But, you know, 14 to 18. I have some really nice, straight, soft red maple. Yeah. And, uh, and a lot of it has that ambrosia beetle in it, which... Oh, yeah. What I was going to say is, if you're planning on... I mean, this thing will do... I think the... Here, we can measure the, the throat opening on this as wide as it'll go. Yeah, the, their website now says 34 and a half. So that is about as wide as it'll go. No, go ahead. Yeah, it, I'm actually getting Good. about 35. So, and that's, I've talked about that before as well. They say you can do a 40 inch 
log on here, but that's if you're milling dimensional lumber, right? If you're going to take right. the top slab off, slab off both sides, and a slab off the bottom, because by the time you do that, you shrink the log. But if you're going to do a live edge, if you're going to take the log and just live edge slab it the whole way through, you're maxed out at the throat opening here, which is 35 inches. Yeah. And the, you got to consider the height in that too when you're down as far as you you can go. Yep. Um, yeah, so you the, know, unless you're going to take that first slab off, you can measure to here. And I think this gonna, mill actually has one of the best depths from the power head down to yeah, what, what is that? the blade. I think it's like, uh, it's about 13 inches. I would say Close, yeah. once you tighten the blade up, it's probably going to come up a little bit. I would say 12 to be safe. If you're going to be doing stuff that is 30, 35 inches, they've got different power head options on here as well. And I would say get the biggest engine you can. And yours you is a 22 horse from your, uh, it's the 390. I got that wrote here It's somewhere. the GX 690. 690. Yeah, is what's on there. I was going to ask you how, how well this works for you. And when you, because you did some live edge slabs in one of your videos. Uh. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been very happy with this engine. I, I haven't, I mean, it's a Honda, so that's great that they put Honda motors on. Right. Um, I have not had anything that this thing won't cut. And if you've got, the biggest thing is having a sharp blade, you know, it's kind of like a, a chainsaw. If you've got a sharp chain on a top handle saw, right. <laughs> it's going to cut, you know. Um, so as long as you've got a sharp blade on this, uh, it, this 22 horse has done a fantastic job for us. That blade protector over there is another one of the options. How, how uh, I know that, <laughs> You still got to watch all the time, but have you, has it ever stopped you? Or? I, I've just become accustomed. I've hit maybe twice, and it's always when you're in a hurry. Like there was one time I was working on a project up in the shop, and it was at night, and I was I needed trim. Yeah. And so I came down here in the dark, and I was like, I'll just throw something on real quick, tighten the the blade, and cut a couple pieces of trim, and. It was at night, and I'll tell you what, you can see sparks pretty good at night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but this, this is, is this a dust? I know this is up and so, down. It is. So, yeah, right here is the lever for that. So okay. that is supposed to keep you from um, it hits the hitting. It hits stops. It, yeah. It, that will hit the log stops before the blade will. Um, I have found that it sometimes get in the, gets in the way if you have... A log that has a sure. lot of knots on it like this yeah when you're trying to run down through this will hit that knot that's why you can pull it up out of the that's way. why you can pull it up out of the way and it doesn't, doesn't just sit there um, <clears throat> I actually I usually run it up out of the way and you can lock it up okay what am I stuck on here oh oh it's because I've got the mill head all the way up yeah <laughs> um, let me drop that down real quick so the other nice thing we talked about the simplicity of this machine Literally the raising and lowering on this machine. They've got a garage door spring here It's all mechanical with gears and a chain and you can see to drop the head down. You can literally just And then it's got a brake That easy to lower and adjust you've got your scale right here um, And I found the scale to be extremely accurate yeah, that was one of my questions so because I am completely unfamiliar with even looking at one of these scales and with all this these other uh, columns mean? I, I don't use any of the other ones. I just use the regular ruler. Um, I know that the curve of the blade on this is about an eighth of an inch. So if I want to cut true one inch thick material, I've got to go, let's say I'm at 15. My next cut needs to be at 13 and, and seven, seven eighths. eighths. And that'll give me right about a one inch thick board. Uh, this mill will cut all the way down to one inch and one eighth. So the log stops, when they're all the way down, you can cut one inch and one eighth without hitting them. It still makes me nervous. Yeah. <laughs> I still, I still yeah. as I'm going through on that final cut, I'm bending down, looking at them, right. making sure that, uh, because even if one side is all the way down, the, the clamp side, there's a little yeah. bit of play that can go either higher or lower. So I always am yeah. watching you on that final cut. You better have your, your helper walk along and watch. What? Yeah. They, they say there's two types of Sawyers in the world, ones who have uh, hit their log stops and ones who haven't yet, but they're going to, you know. And I want to say I didn't hit my log stops for probably two years. And then, like I said, and that it's, was when you had this thing out of the way. 
Yeah. And you were trying to cut something real quick at night. Yeah. And you're just, you get in a rush because you're working on something else and you're just doing something on the mill real quick. And yeah. And that's always fun because then you pretty much, it's always better just to take your time because then by the time you got to go, go back up to the house, get a new blade, change yeah. the blade yeah, you out. Don't save any time. Don't <laughs> save any time. Oh, and I've seen, uh, I know Brock from Rock Hill Farm. He was pretty, uh, adamant about wanting to get a power head lift i have never once felt like i needed one with this mill because it has that garage door spring yeah raising and lowering is super easy i mean it doesn't get any easier than that it the the garage door spring takes all the weight off the power head and you can go ahead and try that too if you want to see sure um I, just set my... I don't think easy boardwalk even offers a power head up and down but I think this is faster. You know, it's kind of like power seats in a car. I'd rather have manual seats because if you want to slide up or back, it's so much easier to just do it yourself. This is pretty pretty well locked in. It's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, power seats in a car, I feel like you got to wait five minutes to either get all the way forward or all the way back. It's just quicker to do it manually. So I remember you, it does take a little getting used to because right. it's almost like patting your head and rubbing your belly at the right. same time. You got to pull one down and rotate the other. Yeah. Um, but once you get Not the hang bad. of it. And it's good for me because I'm left handed. So my left hand's doing all the good stuff. Yep. So when you're sawing, you, you go down to your level of, you just kind of measure off the bed and then set that from the, from. So for figuring out where you want your first cut to be, that scale is off of the, the deck of the bed, which is these here. It's not off of the rails that the wheels run on. It's what the log is actually sitting on. Right. So some people, they'll add a laser to their sawmill so you can see, but calibrating that laser and getting it set up, and then this thing is vibrating like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know Brock from Rock Hill Farm has said he kind of gave up on his laser because he couldn't get it to stay. Yeah. Like once he calibrated it, there's probably some vibration too. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you got a big motor, you got a, a big blade spinning around. All there's a lot of motion going on with that power head. So I have found that what I do is I just come over here, I put the um, tape measure on the log deck, and then I just kind of eyeball level. So right now, if I want to take my first slab off, I'd take it at 12 inches, and that would take it right about there. And the other thing is, I'll actually check kind of all four. So I'll check here, 12, let's say this one is 14 inches, this is 12, this is 11, and this is 10 and a half. I know if I want to get a clean edge all the way down, I've got to go to 10 and a half, which means more waste on that end. Right. But that's where I was talking about. If your log has any crook to it, you're, you're going to be, a, you're going to be taking a pretty heavy slams. cut here in the middle right. or, or a dip. Yeah. To get it down. And that's another thing. Don't mill logs longer than what you need. Because if, if your log has a crook to it and you only want four foot pieces, cut it in half. You'll right. get a lot more lumber out yep. of this four foot piece and this four foot piece than trying to cut the full eight foot if it's got a crook to it. So I'll take this level here and I'll run it across the bed rails and I'll measure from that level up to the pith. So right there is about four inches. And then I'll do the same thing on the other side. And I already know this log is going to need to come up on this side because this end is so much smaller. Right. So that's where we talked about that hydraulic bottle jack is I can raise this up so that that first cut, if I'm going to be two inches into the wood on that side, I should be pretty close to two inches into the wood on this side as well. And then again, when you go to flip it, you need to remember to drop that all the way back down because if not, you're going to be cutting a triangle. Right, <laughs> right. And well, I've done you, that. Then you go, well, you flip it to the 90 degrees and then you're going to have to level it again at that point. Yes, you, you have to level it on two sides. Two so sides. this side and this side. And then once you get those two sides leveled, then everything, everything after that, you just got to clean it up. Right. Well, I've, I've made the point before that a <clears throat> manual sawmill, when you start getting into big logs, you need something to turn them. You could get a, a hydraulic mill that's fifty or sixty thousand right. dollars, or you could get a manual mill and an excavator, 
and then have an excavator to do all your other projects. <laughs> right. You know? <laughs> so I kind of like this setup. I mean, if you can afford a, uh, an excavator and a hydraulic sawmill, by all means, yeah. great. But now this is this is going to be a, a hobby for me. It's not going to be some huge money making thing. It's something to keep me going for, you know, the rest of my retirement as long as I stay healthy. And you know, I have one or two of my boys that are kind. They still you know they hunt and and enjoy the land, and it may be something they get into. Yeah. So I love it. I mean, I I wasn't sure when we got this if I was going to. I thought I would like it, but you never know. Right. You know, it might be something that, uh, it's a lot more work than I thought or whatever, but it's yeah. it's honestly a lot of fun and it's so rewarding. Yeah. Uh, I don't sell a ton of lumber. I sell a very small amount. Mostly what we do with this is for personal use for projects here on the property. With a manual mill, it's a lot of work to make a living, I think. Oh, yeah. But the, the it's worth it when you're doing projects for yourself. Right. Now, when you talked to Stanton, did he tell you what the lead time was on these? He told me eight weeks. He said he could have it sometime in May. Yeah, it's I'm, I'm crazy. Not in that big of a hurry for it, but if it's there, fine. But uh, I know uh, when we got ours, it was just before COVID. I think they had about a six-month lead time, and then COVID hit, and they had a year lead time. I like to think that they're lead time went from six months to a year because of our videos but i <laughs> I, I think the yeah. economy overall also had something to do with that but um wow. yeah they and now they're at eight weeks and that just goes to show you what the inflation and interest rates and all that has done really slowed the economy down and yeah. so if you're one of those people that wanted to get one of these mills during covid and you didn't want to wait the year lead time for it now you can get them in about eight weeks, which I think is, we're kind of getting back to normal on that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, I think that's uh, pretty much covered the mill, most mostly in its entirety. Let's go ahead and fire it up and let you run a log through. Sure. So another thing about the simplicity of this machine is it's got a little T-handle here for the blade tensioner. So if you just go ahead and tighten that, and what you're looking for, you don't need a torque wrench or anything, you're looking for that washer to be level or flat with that little square uh, bar sticking out there. And that's how you know that it's tightened So I gotta enough. look at that just yep. to see how close I am. So the face, you're talking the face of this, even with the face of that. Yep, exactly. And that looks to be about good right there. Now the other nice thing about this mill is the blade lube is automatically synced with when you throw your handle to engage the drive belt. So all you have to do is just turn it on. And I usually go about three quarters to one full turn on there. And it's just gravity fed from your blade lube down through here. And you can see when you throw this, it opens that valve and allows the blade lube to start flowing. Other mills, you have to turn your blade lube on and off with every cut. That can be kind of a pain in the butt. Or if you uh -huh. forget to, to turn it off after you finish a cut, you're gonna be wasting a ton of blade lube. Not that blade lube's the most expensive thing in the world, but why be wasteful? Right. Um, so we'll go ahead and turn that. And the blade lube goes in the gas can. Yes, that is one thing that is I find odd about this mill is they've got a black can for gas and a red gas can for the blade lube. But they do have it labeled, so you, yeah. you can't screw it up. But just, you know, for whatever reason, in, in their uh, raw material procurement for tanks, that's what they decided to go with. The one thing I will say is adding a roof to it like this does make tipping a five gallon gas can into the gas tank a little challenging. So I've got a little- You have a pump? A little pump that yeah. I use, and that gets rid of that problem. Um, the other thing is because this is gravity fed, I usually leave this cracked so that you don't create a vacuum and it allows the blade lube to let gravity do its thing and run good down. Good point. Other than that, I think we should be good to go ahead and fire it up. So all you have to do is pull the choke out, turn the key, and it might take four to six seconds. You, put to, it on, you leave it on max when you're going to start? Yep, because it, it automatically idles down when this is up. Oh, okay. So when you push this down, you'll actually hear the engine engage and, and throttle up. So oh. I just leave it on max all the time. That's nice. It's a gas saver that way too. Yep. Yep. Okay. We ready? Yep. Don't want 
to burn up your starter. Yeah. It's cold. There we go. That's all it takes. So then I'll put the choke back in, let it warm up, and then we'll get the milling. So what I like to do at this point is check to see how the blade is cutting. And like I said before, I've got this uh, six foot level here that I use as a straight edge to check to see how flat and true the blade is cutting. It looks pretty good. There's a very small amount of wave in this right now, which I kind of expected because this blade is uh, getting to the end of its sharpness right now. Um, so if I was cutting some valuable lumber or something, I'd probably switch out the blade. but for what we're doing right now and just skinning these logs up and making cans, um, I'm not too worried about it. Whenever I go to actually cut one by material or whatever out of this, I'll put a fresh blade on. So you may be wondering why this end is not getting cut and it's because I probably am gonna end up cutting this part of the log off anyway. And to get a nice square cant out of this end would mean I'd have to waste a lot more lumber on the big end and I'd rather have more lumber that's 10 foot long than less lumber that's 12 foot long. Now that we've done two sides, we can undo these and we can drop our hydraulic jack all the way down because we're done centering the pit. Or everything from this point is pretty straightforward. You always roll them onto the uh to these instead of the, these logs stopped here. Oh, you know what? Those are for bigger logs. For bigger logs. Um, I take it back. I did not know everything about this mill. <laughs> I, How long I, have you had it? I, three years. I've never used them. And there's been instances where, let me pull this out a little bit yep. and we'll take a look at those. I've never used those. And honestly, I didn't even know they were there. So there are two built-in log stops that are taller. But that way when you turn it, you don't, like what I just did, right. when, when it's taller than this stop, it can actually take that corner out. Right. Um, well, like I said, I stand corrected. I, I don't know why I never even noticed these. They just kind of blended in with the rest of the framework. 
but good to know. There you go. And once again, we'll get a measurement on where our next cut needs to be. <clears throat> See, to get that square, I'd have to go all the way down to eight and a half. Oh, that one's eight and a half too. See, this one's nine and three quarters, and this one's ten and a half. So I'll probably do nine, and we'll see where that ends up. Okay, so at this point, this would be where you would maybe want to start actually milling lumber. We've got it slabbed out and it's a square cant now. But let's say right now you wanted to clamp this down and take one bys out of this log. So right now we're at nine inches, so you're going to get one by nines out of this. If you wanted to do that, you could clamp this one time and then just go to town milling in one inch increments down. So right now, this log stop is one and one eighth above the uh, the bottom of that rail. So that's where your your maximum thickness or your minimum thickness on your final cut has to be one and one eighth. And when you're clamping this down, you just need to make sure that your log stops, because even though that, you can see how much play there is on that. Now, right now I'm not moving the clamp on the other side. So when you clamp this down, you just wanna make sure you're in less than one and one eighth from the bottom of the log or else you will hit that. Gotcha. All right, so we just finished milling up that cant and uh, one other feature that I forgot to mention earlier when we were talking about it is the orientation in which you turn the logs. And you might not think that's important, but it's actually designed that way to lengthen the life of the blades. So as you are peeling the cants off this, that first cut, you're going into bark on this side and you're exiting with bark on this side. But every slab you take off after that, once you turn it, that blade is entering the log on a clean face. And so that's going to lengthen the life of your blade because the things that dull your blade is going to be bark and dirt and all that. Now you're still exiting through bark on the opposite side, but, uh, you know, that's going to significantly cut down on the wear of the blade. And the thought there is it's lengthening the life of the blade. You'll get more board foot of lumber out of the blades. And, you know, blades are a big expense of running a sawmill. I mean, they're, depending on what you get, anywhere from $25 to $40 per blade. So, All right, so I did film a wrap-up with Randy before he took off. But uh, unfortunately, I'm playing around with some new microphones and I lost all of the audio. But uh, he's now gone. We got this log pretty well squared up. The last little foot or so here I'm going to cut off and have some 11 foot boards instead of 12 foot boards and I'm okay with that. But uh, I feel kind of bad. We did all the hard work and now the fun part of actually making some dimensional lumber will be at 2x4s or 1x6s or something. That's the fun part because from here on out it's super easy. It's You just let the mill run and you just keep making passes one inch down, one inch down or two inches down or whatever it may be that what you're milling. But like I said, my goal for this right now is I'm just trying to get as many logs as I can squared up because I don't know what I'm gonna be using these for yet. So at least right now I still have options, all the hard work is done, and then I can come back later and mill this into whatever I want. So I think to wrap this video up, I'm probably going to try to throw on a couple more logs and just get them all squared up on a time lapse.